Okay, so this is just kind of fun and games. So if speak up, and uh, I'll try not to take too long. So this question comes up um, occasionally to to us. We get asked um, by like people that are just learning BPF, like they don't know much about BPF. They're like a director or something, or they're like an, an, doing some sort of like a, analysis of languages, right? And the question was or analysts and an, <laughs> analysts. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so the question was like asked of me a couple times, and I was thinking, well, is this actually true or not true, right? Um, if you don't know what a Turing machine is, like this is my cartoon. I'm not gonna write the full formula down. Like you go to like Wikipedia or anywhere on the web and find the like the actual articulation of a Turing machine. But if you don't know, the basic idea is you have a tape. That's the top part. It has infinite memory, right? And then you have a, a, a needle there that can either write, can read and write to the tape. And then you have a program at the bottom with the state machine that tells you if you should read, write, and then if you need to go left or right. And there's like a formal function that that has to meet um, and a definition of the tape and the alphabet and all that good stuff. But I'm gonna skip over the formal definition and just talk a little bit about this part. Um, so what does this actually, like what does this mean like in you know, what's Turing complete mean in uh, kind of not mathematically formal terms? It means you can do loops, means you have control flow, and you have this unlimited memory tape. Of course, we know that that's not actually true, so we have this arbitrarily large memory. That's how we replace that. Technically, that moves you down in the language hierarchy and all that fun stuff, but you know, for, for the fun and games part, we're not gonna define all of that. We'll just say arbitrary large memory, control flow, and loops, right? Um, then, like, what does it actually mean? Like, why do I care? This is probably a good question that I always ask when people ask me this. Um, there's some things that cannot be solved by Turing machines. There's some things that can be solved by Turing machines. You know, the halting problem is the classic one. Um, you cannot tell if you're going to halt. A mortality problem is basically, do all of these strings terminate with this machine? The word problem for groups is given like an expression and a set of um, rules on that expression. Can it be reduced to the equivalent strings, basically? It's like a, a fun algebraic problem. Um, so those things cannot be solved. What can you do? You can simulate Turing machines. Um, if you've seen the game of life, you can run the game of life on your Turing machine. Um, you can compute general recursive functions, and I don't know about you, but I've been, you know, really wanting to do that with my BPF programs. What else can it do? It can do all these useful things too, right? Like actually parse traffic, DDoS protection, collect metrics, file integrity monitoring. So like all this useful stuff BPF can do, right? Whether or not it's Turing machine complete doesn't really matter to do all the useful things. Um, so who cares? These are, this is sort of my caricature of people that ask me this question, right? So usually it, it can be somebody who's learning BPF, who's trying to understand the big picture. Maybe they have like a language and compiler background. Maybe they're an academic and they just wanna like, they're coming to BPF and like asking these kind of questions and trying to compare it to other languages they, they know, right? The other, the second person who, who comes and asks this question is usually already convinced that it's not Turing complete and they'll say things like, you can't write an HTTP parser because it's not Turing complete, and what if you have endless headers in your HTTP parser, right? Or like, I have Geneve, and I want you to parse every TLV in the Geneve thing, right? So these, these kinds of things, and they're usually already set against BPF, and they may or may not have another solution in mind, usually. Uh, and then the character three is, is kind of myself, who has just thought, like, this would be fun to do, so let's do it. Um, Okay, so, oh, uh, a little bit of side point. Um, so the main problem is gonna be the loops, right? Because we know BPF can do control flow, no problem. BPF can do um, arbitrary memory because we have maps of array sizes that can be arbitrary large. Um, 64 point size bit pointers aside, right? Um, then the other point I just make when people ask this is like they're worried about upper bound times, like being able to loop. Having an upper bound is actually a pretty useful property of a system, right? Usually I don't want my networking to run forever. I want it to have an upper bound. 
Same way with any kernel security, any schedulers, XDP, right? In general, at least in most of the work that we do, we're trying to drive down the program cost. We're not like trying to see if we can do more loops. So there we go. Um, I actually have trouble finding a useful use case for eBPF where I would not want this property of boundedness. So like, I'm interested if there's some, some reason people want like unlimited runtime BPF where you have no clue where it, where it stops, right? Um, I couldn't think of anything particularly useful. I mean, you know, calculating function to side and playing game of life inside BPF. Yes, let's go, you asked. <laughs> there was a real use case. So there oh, is really? this uh, causal profiler approach. Okay where you slow down everything except like one or two different things and measure how that, like actually one thing, sure. and then like, measure how uh, speed, kind of like you simulate speeding up something right. by slowing down everything else. Okay. And then like you measure how much, like if you speed up something 2x, how much it influences like the overall latency, so right? So uh, <laughs> why not? Like BPF slows down everything yeah. except like one code pass. So you do that with like a sleep? Which well, would be you a can wild burn CPU or <laughs> sleep, yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll, I'll put that in the next slide deck. <laughs> something, <coughs> something also relevant is that I'm thinking of how to inject the latencies using BPF. Okay. So this latencies you can't. I want it to be like a, to be customizable at the runtime. So right. you specify the latencies at runtime. So yeah. when you write a program, you don't know how long gonna delay, and uh, mm -hmm. that's something okay. I'm thinking of recently. Okay. Also do that. It, it sounds almost like we need a sleep, which wouldn't, you know, have the have a, a BPF helper for sleeping, and then um, sleep for as long as you as you say. Cool. T all right, two use cases. I stand I stand corrected. Um, all right. So if we want to show that it's Turing complete, the real hook is like, how do we do loops, right? Like, how do we get something to run forever? I think. Um, if anybody objects, let me know if you, if you think that the memory maps aren't lar arbitrary large and the control flow is, is not an if-else, but I think we're pretty good. Um, and the arbitrary large depends on that we don't want to argue about 64-bit pointers, which some people do. All right, so we basically need to do again. Um, so this is what I did for a do again so that we could recursively loop. I just create a callback with a timer of zero. You'll get right and as long as there's you get put back on the timer list and you'll get called back immediately with your callback. And this will run forever until it terminates. All right. Any objections to my loop? It's pretty close, right? It's not much different than like a CPU relax, for example. Right? And I don't think anybody would argue CPU relax is not is 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 okay in your loop. Um all right, so we have a loop, so like we, with that, and so then the question is, does that, is that enough for Turing complete? This is just a sketch, but what you would say is, showing, th showing something that's Turing complete, usually you'd wanna build something that simulates a Turing machine. That's sort of a pain to do, so we wanna find something that's Turing equivalent, um, basically because of the properties of Turing machine. If something's Turing complete, you can simulate the thing that's Turing complete, then you can simulate Turing machine by, um, by walking through the chain. So there's these things called two-tag systems, which are sort of interesting and useful, but also easy to program. What they are is a set of production rules, um, which tell you what to do when you see the letter A or B. So you can just say, when I see an A, I want to append A, B, A, B at the end. And when I see a B, I'm gonna append an A at the end. Um, and then there's a cut number, which says how many numbers you wanna take off the front. So you Read the first letter, tells you what to prepend, and then you cut off two from the front. And um, there is a, 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 a papers, I didn't put a link, but I can put a link to it. There, there's a bunch of papers that'll show you that this is actually equivalent to a Turing machine um, and can simulate any Turing machine, which gives you, and any Turing machine can simulate that it's a universal Turing machine, and so you get your chain. So all you need to do is simulate this, all right? Oh, I, I'm not gonna do a demo, I guess. Let's see. Is this gonna work? There we go. Um, did it crash in the back? Oh, I, I killed it, okay. So, um, 
basically, I, I, in the Cilium eBPF library, uh, mostly because I wanted to figure out some of the Cilium eBPF APIs on the latest version, um, I created a, a Turing example. Um, basically, it's an implementation of the two tags with the set of productions. Um, and what it'll do is when you run it, oh, type in my secret password. And um, what it'll do is it'll sit there and run until it runs out of memory and then it crashes. But what it's doing is, um, since this is a non-terminating example of a two-tag system, you probably can't see it from there. It's replacing AB with BA and B with AB. Maybe I'll make it bigger. There you go. So it's going to sit here and run for uh, forever since this is a non-terminating one. The terminating ones are also interesting, but it's, it's kind of more fun to show a, a non-terminating case for, um, for this example. And um, it's one program, program execution with a timer. So like you ran the program just once. You don't like constantly run it. No. No, no, this is just a, um, here, I'll show you the code. Stop that, otherwise it never exits. Um, so there's just an echo tree. So, whatever. The code's really ugly, by the way. I wrote this last night or something. But, um, let's see. So, so this is a loop machine. So it, it's just this, this function, um, which you can see here when we, when we terminate, what we do is we just post to the ring buffer, we post the string. So every iteration of this loop, we're posting what the current string is to over the ring buffer. All you're seeing on the printer side is that printing. So we just re read the buffer, and every time we get a new string, we print it. Um, that's the terminating case. You can see I'm messing around with it there. Um, but down here is... Um, here's the production rules for A, here's the production rules for B. So they're in a map, so you can put whatever production rules you'd like. So we just read out the production rule for that entry, and then we, we basically prepend it and then cut based on whatever the cut value is that we configured from the user space. Some print case there, because I wasn't sure it was actually working. And then, um, so that's one step. And then you just, call your loopback machine again through the timer, run it again for every step. And it will run until it terminates, or it will run until your system runs out of batteries. And how, how do you trigger it? What was the trigger for this? Oh, really? You, TCP connect, because, you know. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, it's an F-entry program on TCP connect. But I, I was smart enough to do this enable thing so that it didn't start a new Turing machine every time my system <laughs> connected to something, right? But then anyways, you, you, what you do is you just, I mean, there's, there's probably tons of better ways to do this, right? But I just write it out of a map, init. This init has your init configuration out of a map. It's an, it's an array of one, so it's a load underneath the covers. Um, you look up your tag, your tag is that string. Um, and then you kick off the timer, you init the timer, and you kick it off. Um, maybe this is interesting. I don't know if everyone does, does this, but um, if you want to copy arbitrary string sizes, right, you just do a probe read from your, from your string back into your string. Um, that way you don't have to do like a, try to do a mem copy. You just use the helper to do the mem copy. Mem set to zero, you pass null as a source for probe read read. And it should be BPF probe read kernel, by the way. You're setting a bad example here. <laughs> you know what? This runs on 4.19. So, or, well, no, I guess so when, did, when were timers introduced? Probably after the probe read. With kernel. BPF, it doesn't matter. You always use BPF probe read kernel and it substitutes BPF probe read on all kernels. I'll fix it before the blog post. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I mean, this whole program's a mess, right? Like, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> It was a, I mean, and, and it's from TCP Connect, so. Um, so anyways, that, that's the program. That's, the, that's my Turing Complete thing. I think we might do something fun with it. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else. That was, that was just the fun after 
lack of you know break thing. No questions. Yeah, no questions. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think now we convince the analysts going forward nice. that we're doing complete. You can you can program anything in BPF you want to. There's no limits. It's as powerful yeah. as your computer. BPF Foundation declares <laughs> BPF Turing complete from now on. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We should start, you know, computing recursive functions and doing like serious what math math functions instead of BPF because we can't use that. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much.